isn't it? Okay. Huh? Everything all right? Right. Can you get me there? Right. Let me just look at it here. Right. Romans chapter 4. And um, we come to asking what it was that Abraham found. What Abraham found? Well, not he didn't go on an egg hunt. He found something much greater than that. And we consider this as we follow on from the previous chapters of Romans where we've considered the way of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ being justified freely by his grace. And this brings up the question then, well, what happened in the Old Testament? Isn't there one religion established in Abraham that will continue? So why, could there be a, a change that's happened of some sort? Um, this is quite set there. All right. What are we to make then of Abraham? You think, well, if you're a, a person that's following God, you must be following Abraham. This was, God made great promises with Abraham, and suddenly we're talking about being justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, we consider at different times the various Old Testament prophecies that point that always going to be the Messiah coming to be the Saviour and so um, for all that people en ended up trusting in their religious ways more or less and not in a righteousness from God and in this chapter 4 we see that the ways that God had used in the Old Testament of making a person acceptable with God uh, because they're rather similar in the most important ways are similar to, to how it comes in the New Testament through Jesus Christ it's very important because you hear today people talk about the three great Abrahamic faiths as if Abraham had three different faiths of some sort or three faiths could be could be um, derived from Abraham but it's only Christianity biblical Protestant Christianity I'd say evangelical gospel preaching Christianity Bible believing trusting in Christ alone that is the faith of Abraham continued on into the present day the ways of Judaism and of Islam are completely un-Abrahamic. They're not Abrahamic religions, though they claim Abraham as an ancestor. Remember Jesus said to people that said Abraham was their father, he said, your father's the devil, because they didn't have the faith of Abraham. They were using it as a, as a, as a that was all that they knew, perhaps, but they were ungodly and hypocritical, not having a true faith. Now, <laughs> what was it then that Abraham found? What is the connection between Abraham and the Old Testament and Jesus Christ in the New Testament? It's very interesting. And it um, shows, what we see here will show this continuity between the two. Obviously you feel things are very different. Oh, isn't it different in the Old Testament to what it is in the New? Well, we say it's clearer in Jesus Christ you can see there's my saviour that died for my sins and you look back to the time of the first Good Friday 2000, nearly 2000 years ago but with in the days of Abraham they were looking ahead to promises so the way it worked was slightly different and it was limited to this well it was Abraham's family it wasn't even a nation it wasn't even the nation of Israel in Abraham's day it was just his family that had this call from God. The rest of the world had gone their own way. Since the days of Adam and Eve, there had been a few of them that kept calling out to God. But something special happened in Abraham's day that teaches us that the ways of Jesus Christ fit together perfectly with it. Now, that may sound like a lot, 
Well, it's actually, I'm going to speak of some very simple things now. And firstly, what did Abraham find? Well, it says in here, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? And the, um, the, the expression, as pertaining to the flesh, um, could mean that it, it, he's our father pertaining to the flesh, he's found something pertaining to the flesh, or he's found something in a kind of way by his own works. Now that's a bit complicated to see exactly where this phrase comes in here. But I think the next verse answers it clearly. It says, if Abraham were justified by works, think of the works of the flesh, things that we do, he had whereof the glory. If Abraham was such a good man that he could be justified, that is, counted righteous, absolutely accepted by God, justified, from all the sins and wickedness because he did good things, this is what people think of religion, isn't it? Do good, this, doing good things, being, you know, saying we're going to be good, we're going to be pleasing to God because we've done this and done that. It says he would have had something to glory in. But he didn't. Abraham wasn't like that. Abraham didn't boast of himself, you see. And he says, but not before God. Well, even if he did have something to boast of, he couldn't boast before God, could he? Whatever good thing he'd done, how could he come before the Almighty, the all-glorious God, and, and say, look at me? It would be ludicrous. It would be ludicrous for any of us to say, well, we're coming to heaven. I'm sure God's going to be very pleased with us and welcome us in and there'll be a big celebration. Oh, look at us. Half of us are not even able to get, well, I say, out to church. Uh, a lot of people, you've been able to come here this evening, but we're, we're not able to even worship God regularly and with, with, with a willing desire and an eagerness. But Abraham, though he did many good things, he didn't have anything to boast of or glory of himself before God. Neither should we. You might think, well, I'm better, at least I'm here. Other people have come. I, haven't I done well? Whoa, hold back. We've got nothing to glory of before God. You must be very careful. So, but he found something. And we should want to know about this because to have Abraham, to be connected to Abraham by Jesus Christ is quite amazing. Abraham was 2,000 years BC. And yet, <laughs> so 4,000 years ago, and God had, he found something with God that then was to be a promise to all nations that came through Jesus Christ. So there's something very, very special when we start talking about Abraham. So, what is it? Well, how can we know? Well, if we're like some, and they say, well, these, there are these various Abrahamic faiths, then we make up what we want, say what we like. But the text here in verse 3 says, For what saith the Scripture? What does the Bible say about it? That's how we know. You know, when I first went to a church where they really they would say got into the Bible and started to preach the Bible, it came alive to me. Oh, all what was a mystery? You didn't know where you were going. It's like having a road without signposts. Where's the way to Scotland? There's no signs. We're never going to get there. People say, well, you can get there on any road. Just go down there and see. We're, we're not going to be critical of anyone going down towards Brighton if they're headed towards Scotland or going towards Cornwall or going towards um, Italy or India. But we're going to Edinburgh. Well, that, we, we, you'll get there. Have you? No, it doesn't work like that. We've got the Bible. So we want to know about Abraham. We've got the Bible, the record. The Jews kept it. They copied every page of the Bible for 2,000 years until the time of Jesus and they copied every word, every letter exactly. And if there was one, more than one letter that was mistaken, let's start again, a new page, all written by hand. Can you imagine how long it took to get a good copy? Not surprising that the scribes who wrote the Bible were rather proud of themselves. You can see, they're saying, oh, we've written another copy of the Word of God. They would boast 
And, and even since, through the medieval times, people copying a Bible out by hand. Can you imagine how long it would take? Do you think they would please God? They'd find their way to heaven? Well, do you think if there was anything you could do, give the word of God to people? But of course, it's not the way to make ourselves right with God. It's impossible. But it says here, Abraham believed God. This is what the scripture says. What says the scripture? And it quotes from Genesis uh, chapter 15, which we read earlier. And it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. I want to take you back a little bit to this and, and to what happened in Genesis 15. Because if you've ever been out on a dark night, probably not around here, and seen the stars. If, can you remember going out sometime and seeing a starry night? Anybody? With millions? We saw some in Ireland back in November. We went out in the dark outside the place we were staying, looked at the sky and it was just wonderful. <laughs> Speckled with stars, like a shiny diamond, but lots and lots of them. You could not see a most beautiful... Comfortable. I'm sure you've all seen a starry night at times, maybe in, in, in Malta or in India, in a dark night. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. Do you remember seeing it? We don't see it here in yeah, London. Yeah. Have you seen a dark starry yeah. night? Yeah, in Derby. In Derby as well, yeah. Well, fantastic. And then the countryside, a little bit out of the country. Even here you can see a few stars. Amazing. We think we're just only eight miles from central London. You can see some, or six miles, is it? You can see some. But um, on a dark night, so this is what happened to Abraham. God told him, firstly, in Genesis 15, he said, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What a thing to say to someone. God, in this long time ago when God spoke by the prophets before Jesus was here, and we've got to remember, it's a greater thing, though we can't see Jesus, that he's been, that he's died for our sins, that we can trust him. That's a, a very, very, something very, very sure about that. We've got to be sure that, that, that we're sure about Jesus Christ. But in the Old Testament, God would appear to people and say something. And of course, well, how, how do you, does one react? We can't imagine it, what it must be like. But the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, Fear not, well, the first thing, you'd be afraid, wouldn't you? If God spoke to you. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Abraham was going to go out from his home place and he's going to be living in the middle of nowhere, really. And God was going to get, give him great promises. But he was not going to be afraid because God would be a shield, protect him. And God himself would be his great reward. He'd be the, the thing, the person. God himself would be what Abraham would have and know and love. as a great promise to him. Well, he said, well, how does he know? How does he believe it? And there's this promise then about his offspring. That he'd have a great number of children and then grandchildren great-grandchildren and you could go on and on and on until you get to the Lord Jesus one of his greatest descendant of all and then you've got all the people who believe in Jesus become adopted into that same family everyone who's a real Christian is adopted into the same family as Abraham's family so although we've been adopted it's very real the papers are done the form signed the child has been adopted. They were born uh, under Mr. Smith, but Mr. Jones has adopted him, and he's now Mr. Jones, adopted. It belongs to him, and so with the Christian. In Jesus Christ, we belong to Abraham's great family. But there's Abraham. He's an old man. His wife's old, past the point of having children, and God takes him out, and he says, look at those stars. And he sees that starry night. And he says, look now toward heaven and tell the stars, count the stars, if thou be able to number them. Well, I don't know if Abraham would have even tried. And it was a dark night, no doubt, where there was no street lights in those days. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be, thy offspring seed be. And he believed in the Lord. 
and he counted it to him for righteousness for righteousness him Abraham believing in the Lord who's shown him the stars and has showed him that it told him that he's if you could count the stars that's your offspring very very rich and profitable life and you're going to have all these children and millions and millions of them and so this was a promise to Abraham an old man and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness now this is a very important principle it's absolutely it's the, it's the most wonderful thing and what we're seeing here is the same principle that was spelt out in Romans chapter 3 that we're justified that's to be counted righteous it's the same word order freely by his grace his gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus so he concludes that a man verse 28 of chapter 3 is justified by faith without the deeds of the law you see it can't be both can it either we believe God and like Abraham looking at those stars huh, there's so many of them that's my offspring for, uh, that is promised to Abraham and how can he believe it he's an old man huh? but he's believed God he's believed in the Lord he knows it's the Lord and he trusts him he's his shield he's his great reward he can't see it but the Lord has declared it and then as Abraham believes it what the Lord said exactly it doesn't say exactly but it said it was counted to him for righteousness this absolute trust in God counted for his righteousness without the work it without working but believing in God can you think of something so amazing that uh, when then the judgment day comes and there's Abraham standing there on judgment day and he said what have you done Abraham and Abraham says well uh, if it was if I was justified by works I'd have something to glory in but not before God nothing to glory in Abraham you you're the great father of this multitude and then of Jesus Christ and then of all the people of God in, in Jesus that love the Lord Jesus you're the father of the faith you should boast about it you should be proud of who you are Abraham, no I've got nothing to boast in I believe in the Lord says Abraham that's my righteousness isn't it amazing though it is it almost does sound funny but it's not funny it's wonderful but it's it's it, you could say well it's it's funny when you think of how of how far away people are from understanding this it's the most wonderful teaching and this is the righteousness they say well how do I know this righteousness well this is the righteousness of Jesus Christ it's the same principle when a person has faith in Jesus Christ it's verse um, 21 of chapter 3 the righteousness of God without the law is outside of the Lord. It doesn't mean we're lawless. It doesn't mean we don't <coughs> have to live to please God. Far from it. Absolute opposite. We have to live to please God as much as we possibly could. How can we be so wonderf wonderfully thankful for being counted righteous through faith in Jesus Christ? It says, Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ it's chapter 3 verse 22 unto all and upon all them that believe we were looking at this previously in chapter 3 but the principle then is here in Abraham and I, I, I won't go on to it this evening at great length we might come back to it consider it again but do you remember that Jesus told a parable in the vineyard of a vineyard where the people started working didn't they and some of them started working 
Early in the day, and they worked through. The, it's been a warm day today. They worked right through the heat of the day, and he promised them a penny. And there was others that began working at the eleventh hour, so probably about five o'clock, and they just did one hour's work before they finished. The other people have worked maybe ten hours or twelve hours, or well, how long? Six hours or longer. Hold on, see if I. I can't look, and they gave them the penny because. Jesus was pointing out that the reward is God's grace. It's what he gives. It's not what we earn. It's a gift of God. And so God justifies. It's not to him that worketh. Verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. See if it, if it was something you'd done to make yourself right with God it would have been a debt that God owed you but it's not it's God's grace and it's a gift of God to have looked to the crucified Lord Jesus Christ and believed in him as it we saw back in chapter 3 justified freely by his grace verse 24 through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation that is a, a wrath-bearing sacrifice, taking away God's wrath, uh, a, a sacrifice. Jesus Christ was he, he, a sacrifice once offered through faith in his blood. So by believing, trusting in the blood of Christ that was shed for sinners, there is a, a redemption and a propitiation and a remission of sins that are past. So this declares his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, if you're going to say, I can ask you the question, are you going to heaven? When you die, will you go to heaven or to hell? Heaven. Huh? Heaven. Because what have you got a righteousness yeah, Christ, died for you. Christ died for you Christ is your righteousness he's our righteousness it's fantastic it's covered to us by faith our faith in him is counted as righteousness to all those that believe in Jesus Christ so we have here really a most uh, wonderful text wonderful part of the Bible to believe this now you say well if we're not sure I'll take you back again to that time when Abraham was taken out yeah that's the thing to look at those and I was I love that verse um, of verse chapter Genesis 15 and verse 6 that he believed in the Lord and it counted it he counted it to him as righteousness I love also the verse the first verse when he says, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. These are wonderful verses in Genesis 15. But this is the first time that I've really thought about that one, that he took him up and he pointed him to the stars. Because you see the complete contrast there. You see the wonderful creation of God. I just wish we could see more night skies and look at stars. Not to learn about stars or to worship stars or anything, but just to be amazed at how God described these stars that he made just very quickly. But how Abraham was taken out by God. He looked at the stars, he showed him them, and the, the, the effect of just looking at them is wonderful. You think, wow, that is an amazing sky. A black sky and then millions and millions of oh, you can't count them can you all little dots of light and he said well that's what your offspring will be like well, some of us haven't got children here but the promises in Jesus Christ are great absolutely greater than this that we have if Abraham believed the principle here is that he believed this um, before he was circumcised. So the, we, it goes on to explain then how this is for all people that believe. 
It was a sign of the righteousness of the faith that he had. So, if you... I know there are signs in the Bible, and there was a, the covenant sign of the rainbow, when God made a rainbow in the time of Noah, after the flood, to promise him that there will be springtime and harvest, uh, summer and winter, and that he wouldn't destroy the earth by flooding again. And it was as when the rainbow came, it reminded people of God's promises, of his grace toward them. And so when we see a night sky, it can remind us that Abraham was taken out by God. He looked at the stars. Abraham was, in a way, destitute of, of his own hope, really. He had no hope of a child. And yet, God showed him this stars, this impossible. He believed against hope. He hoped against hope, the Bible says. He, it looked impossible to him, but he saw God showing him the stars and the great number. Believe the Lord. And so for us is to believe the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if we were serious about whether we would be fit for heaven, we'd have to say no, wouldn't we? Definitely not. Uh, if we were good enough in our own right, yeah, we'd have to say we'd have to say we're absolutely there's no way we could be shining like a star in heaven because we've got a sinful nature we are uh, the bible says we read in romans 3 only there was no fear of god before their eyes it talks in um even here in chapter 4 and verse 5 but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness if we were godly, we wouldn't need to be justified because we'd be righteous of our own accord. We'd be able to boast of ourselves. But we can't. Anybody of that accord is not righteous. <laughs> and so they're trying to work their own righteousness and it's fake. But if we're sincere, when we come to God, we come uh, not like those we spoke of this morning, Ananias and Sapphira, who pretended that they were doing something wonderful and they'd be appreciated, but in fact they were lying. So, likewise us. We say, God justifieth the ungodly. That's me. I'm ungodly. But God justifies, justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. This is a wonderful thing, you see. And then our glorying, our boasting is all in God. It's all in the wonders of Jesus Christ. And then we're happy. Well, th there are two words. There's the word blessed is because God is doing something. But happy is how we feel afterwards. Well, when we feel, when we know this, we feel happy because we're blessed. And we should be. This is blessedness. This is how blessedness comes. It's the gift of God. Now, if you have no conviction of sin, then you're outside of Christ. There must be some conviction of sin. We went through it in the first three chapters of this book. And it concluded, all have sinned. All have come short of the glory of God. If we have a proud look, we're sinning against God. We're turning ourselves into little gods, perhaps. But this is a very, very good news message because it's a promise of God in Jesus Christ and it's absolutely sure and it's solid. There's nothing more solid. If you look, if you try to, uh, uh, try to squash it, bang it, break it, you couldn't break it. It's unbreakable. God's promises are absolutely sure which we come to in my verse. We often quote, don't we? I call it my verse. It, Paul the Apostle talks about my God and my gospel. I hope it's, this is your God and your gospel. But verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, 
It's got to be a gift of God, not of works. To the end, the promise might be sure, because it's God's grace. Therefore, the promise can be sure, because if someone's going to give something, and God's giving it, you're sure, you can be sure to receive it. Now, of course, all this, what do we say? Well, we, we might go on a few chapters in here and say, with the Apostle Paul in chapter 7, O wretched man that I am. If we believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, well, we're talking elsewhere in here, that the Holy Spirit has worked in us a great work. And now our danger is that we grieve the Holy Spirit of God, that we somehow... We, we, we backslide and slip and uh, this we have a continual battle that when you become a Christian you're in a continual war and it's not easy and as a friend used to say the devil's not a gentleman he'll get you at your weakest point when you're feeling well then he'll get you and you tempt you as Ananias and Sapphira were tempted by Satan to just hold back some of that money that they were going to, so they could pretend they'd be more generous and that they were more good than they were. Uh, the devil's very subtle with things like that. I'd, we're better to just not give anything <laughs> but then, than to pretend that we're doing something good when all we are is, well, I use the word that the man used to the Lord Jesus. I'm an unprofitable servant and we, we, you know, he said wasn't it? when you've done all you can say now we're unprofitable servants and recognise that all we have to boast in is the cross of Christ you may have the devil whispering in your ear how bad you are so, yes yeah, true but Jesus Christ is my righteousness he's died for my sins he's my saviour so we have a great hope and we, we're not boasting that we're here and others haven't been able to come this evening we're not boasting in our own righteousness, we're boasting and being encouraged by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which we read of here. His faith was counted for righteousness to Abraham, and there's a little bit more to explain in this uh, chapter, but it goes on to explain that these promises that Abraham had no, were not for him thing. only. Similar to The promises that Abraham had it was reserved for Christ, wasn't it? It was, he was, well, in some way he was looking to Christ, mm -hmm. but he rejoiced to see his day and saw it and was glad that the scripture says. But how how that was is, 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 is not easy for us to understand mm -hmm. to go back into that time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against thee, Lord. We are not worthy to be called thy sons, thy children. And yet, Lord, we have been called to believe as Abraham was to believe. And as it was counted to him for righteousness, so we believe that those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, their faith will also be counted for righteousness. And Lord, we pray for help from heaven by thy Spirit, the Spirit that grants us to believe and to be born again and to have a new life in Christ. The same Spirit, Lord, we pray that he will be at work in us, to restrain us, to keep us from evil, to cause us to love thee, to be truly thankful, and to serve thee faithfully, Lord. We ask for help from heaven. We pray for our friends, those that uh, would have liked to have been here, but for one reason or another were prevented this evening, whether it was by weakness or by Satan or whatever cause it was, they were not able to be here, Lord. We pray for them, that will bless them, and we pray, Lord, for ourselves, that thou would give us strength, not to glory in ourselves, but only in the cross of Christ. What a wonderful salvation, that he bore our sins in his body on the cross. He shed his blood as a propitiation for our sins. What a wonderful sacrifice, Lord, that we are washed by the blood of Christ and counted righteous before thee, Lord, and ready for that day when the judgment comes, not 
to appear before thee to boast in ourselves but to say that we come humbly thanking thee for the Lord Jesus our Saviour and then we come to him and to the eternal glory Lord be merciful to us give us strength Lord in these days of ungodliness even our own ungodliness Lord but we pray that thou would that thou justifies the ungodly we thank thee for that and we pray Lord for help from heaven and we pray for our neighbours and our friends those that work here and that we work with Lord that they may know this wonderful blessing from God and may respond with faith in Jesus Christ Amen